Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Today we're joined by Dan Lawrence, CEO of Foreman Mining. This podcast was produced in person at the recent Jackson Hole Ski Summit, so there's some ambiance and background noise in the show. Thanks to Amanda Cavallari for helping to make these shows possible. Today we discuss Foreman's product stack, how integrating automation and intelligence into mining increases hash rate, and how middleware providers are thinking about energy markets. Introducing the newest and most requested course from Foundry Academy, Intro to Hashboard Diagnosis and Repair, offered by the same experts who provided top technical training Training for mining technicians in the U.S. This Essential Academy course will take place in Rochester, New York from May 1st to the 5th, 2023. With a strong focus on mastering micro-soldering basics, Foundry's dedicated instructors possess years of ASIC hardware experience and will guide you through each step of the process. They'll ensure that you gain the confidence and skills required to undertake basic repair jobs and keep your operation healthy and hashing. Register today at foundryacademy.com. Dan, welcome to the Mining Pod. Uh, really excited for this conversation. We had you on about a year ago. Yeah. Now it's time to revisit, talk about Foreman. Thank you, Will. Good to be here again. I uh, had a blast last time and looking forward to doing it again. We are in Jackson Hole at the Ski Summit. Uh, there's definitely a lot going on. We just had Fred from Marathon and Zach from Bean Spark on. Great conversation. Uh, very different, though, public miners. And I was looking forward to this conversation because it's more about mining itself, right? Like how do we better our operations? Um, and as a service provider, you guys are focused on everybody in the tech stack, everybody in the mining stack, as opposed to clean spark and marathon, they're just like really focused on themselves. And, um, there's obviously a layer of competition to what you guys are doing as well, but as a service provider, you're trying to bring in clients from everywhere. So was looking forward to like the different angle of discussion here. Let's start off though, for those who weren't around or didn't listen to the podcast last time, just a, like your one-on-one intro on Foreman. Yeah, yeah. So Foreman, we are minor management and facility management. We like to consider ourselves to be more facility management software these days. So back when we started traditional minor management, rebooting, configuring machines, high level, we give you a central dashboard that you can go to where you can see all the machines you have deployed in your fleet. Could even be spread across multiple sites. So kind of one page where you can see it and control it all. Was just rebooting, pool changing, firmware upgrading, kind of maintenance of the machines, map management of the machines, and then it's expanded a lot over the last year where now we're more facility management. So we're integrating with network switches, integrating with PDUs, um, integrating with, as an example, if somebody has a cooling tower, maybe they're running the new ant space, I forgot what it's called, the HK3 or something like that. If you have a cooling tower and it has stats on the cooling tower, we can integrate with that, bring all the flow, sensors, temperature, humidity, all that stuff in. So it's really more Big, big picture now, uh, facility management. And then the other side, within the last eight months or so, we've been working pretty hard towards curtailment features. So helping people turn their minds off when they need to be turned off and turn them on when they need to be turned on. Gotcha. Okay, I think a great thing to go through would be uh, what this looks like in practicality for anyone who's sort of outside the scope. Because I think most people come from and like, I'm going to plug in my miner and it's going to talk to a pool and then I get payouts to my wallet. They're not necessarily thinking about it from a different perspective. Um, that that middle where wow, that middle where uh, layer. So walk me through maybe like a deployment. Yeah, the easy way to think why Foreman. If you have one miner or two miners, you probably feel pretty personally connected with them. I know we did when we were hobby mining back in 2016 or so. You have two miners, you can pretty much give each one a name, and you know how to access each one. Every miner has a web page on it, and that's how you'd configure it traditionally. There are some command line tools, but they dif- they get to be hard to scale. So when you go from one or two miners to 100 or 1,000, and you're trying to track things that are maybe dead, where the scanning tool's not going to pick it up anymore, you need something that's a little more robust, has a little more state to it also. So you want something that says, I found 100 miners at some point, now I'm only finding 98, and these two that I know existed are now offline. So that's that's the piece you're missing with scripts and BTC tools and stuff like that. Um, Foreman, the deployment, it's pretty simple and it's actually free for less than 25 miners too. Uh, so if you're a hobby miner, you can just go ahead and give it a rip and we love that. Yeah. Let it roll. So deployment's pretty easy. Yeah. You, you rack and stack the miners. Maybe they're already racked and stacked. You don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, you install the software. It's called pickaxe. That's our agent, our architecture. We can be going to architecture a little bit too, if you want. 
it's an agent in the mine talking to all the miners within the network. So it talks directly to their APIs, directly to their web pages, grabs all the stats, brings them back to itself, compresses them down, and then sends them up to the cloud. So that's how you're able to see it on a web page that isn't, you're not, access, you're not accessing a web page in your mind, you're accessing a web page up in the cloud. So you can kind of see it, control it, monitor it from your phone. Or if you're a distributed team, maybe you have people working different states, monitoring, managing an operation fully remote, you can do all of that now. Uh, the architecture is important to share because some people wonder if, you know, is, do I have to open firewalls? Is Foreman reaching into my network? Do I have to worry about, you know, some malicious actor coming into my network? Am I opening ports and everything? The, the way we architected it is it's chatty within the network, but it's only ever outgoing traffic from the agent up to the dashboard. So no firewall opening, no port forwarding. It's kind of just like when you're browsing your the internet well, on your laptop when you're at home. You don't have to open any firewall stuff to do that. It's the same kind of thing. It's outgoing traffic. So that's how our that's how our application works. So you got the miners on the network, install the software, run a quick network scan. It'll just roll through the IPs that you tell it to go through. You can give it a range. Finds them, identifies what type, you hit save, and now you're in format. Love that. So there's there's lots of complexities here. You managed or you said earlier like PSUs, PDUs, the for the machines themselves. Um, you guys are working with energy providers now. You're integrating like all this data together into like one robust tool set. But you started with the mining, right? Yeah. More or less correct. Yeah. So now that you're looking outwards from there, what is this like how are you guys thinking about building these things out? Because and when I think of a deployment, it's just, there's so many different things that are going on there. And it would be great to have the granular control of almost every single thing and also have data, almost everything. So I can like make an actionable decision. Um, but from you guys, when you're building this out, how do you guys think about it? It's, uh, it's been, it's been a crazy process. Uh, we started very minor focused and I think that held us back for a long chunk of time. One problem we used to have traditionally was you know, we're only showing you the miners that are on the network or were on the network, but then people get into these situations where it's, well, you know, I've got two pallets of miners and I want to track inventory and I know that they're here and I know we're going to be deploying them, but they're not on the network yet. So I can't add them to foreman. So I just got to hope they don't walk away. So we've, we've rolled out a lot of stuff to help with the bigger picture. So now we have like built-in inventory management, so you can track assets, pallets, locations, storage locations. All that gets connected to deployed miners, so they all get connected together. So we kind of like worked our way up a little bit, so from the miner up to the asset. And then we also have this concept called a site map, which gives you this visualization tool to show you how your mine looks, and it's down to the minute updates. So you can visualize the racks, visualize the containers, visualize the entire mine by performance, by heat, by everything. The site map's like a really foundational piece for us, and we didn't realize that it was a good kind of pivot point for us to connect a whole bunch of things together, because now we have something, the concept of a location, and that's the piece that we were missing historically. So now if you have a location, you can connect devices to that location. So now if you have a miner in a location and a device connected to a location, we now know what devices that, monitor, that miner is managed by. So if you have PDUs, you would just add a list of PDUs into Foreman. You can associate, and it could be a dumb PDU or a smart PDU. If it's a smart PDU and you want to be able to get maybe actual consumption off the miner, that's a big, that's a big black hole. If you're, if you're, if you're buying a miner and you're buying it and expecting it to consume 3250 watts, you know, you're going to be, your mind's going to be blown when you plug it in. So a lot of people, especially hosts, need more accurate ways to monitor consumption, uh, all that. So Back to the PDU example, if you have PDUs, you add PDUs in, you tell Foreman each port on the PDU is mapped to this cell in the map, or if it's a cooling tower, this cooling tower covers these two racks, because I know these two racks are in a container that's managed by that cooling tower. And now as you connect miners, as you place them interactively, you're like pressing IP report on the miner, you're, you're filling the rack out in Foreman. We now know every single device that that miner is connected to, and now we can enrich it with actual consumption, humidity. If you have sensors, we can integrate with all those in the containers. If you have the cooling tower, flow rates, inlet temps, outlet temps, pressure, mister statuses, all kinds of stuff. So when you're, when you're running a mine, you don't just need to look at the miners on the shelf. 
It's the ecosystem that's running there. You need to know how the whole thing's working because otherwise you might be looking at a miner thinking, man, this thing's running hot. I have to clean it. But you don't realize that it's because there's something else going on. Maybe you've got bad airflow. Maybe it's a hot pocket. So the site maps, site maps are really key for us. And to provide insight, we're trying to just enrich it and give people more and more information about the mine so you can make better informed decisions. And if you're a host, it's it's a game changer because now you know what miners are consuming. You know how much to invoice for. You can track uptime better. You know if the miner's drawing power. Sometimes the miner might even go offline, but it's still consuming power. So it's good to be able to... Uh, get that from the PDU. So you really need to have a system in place that can collect everything and bring it together so you can make really informed business decisions. Tell me a little bit about like getting this data from the data sources itself. Like that's something that a lot of pool providers or like firmware providers, I should really say, complain about often. Like I can't speak to this machine in the same way I used to in previous generation machines, or I can't speak to this machine uh, increasingly. They're trying to black box people out. I know you guys aren't necessarily building firmware that I know of, um, and you guys are sort of in that middle layer between a user, uh, a facility, a pool, You're kind of communicating those things. But at some level, you're going to have to pull data from the machine and data from the facilities. So again, when you're looking at all the inputs, what is some of the like bottlenecks or trouble spots for you guys? I would say the tricky part, the miners are always the trickiest part. Um, the, the problem that you have with them is the people that develop the firmware don't to develop the machine and the firmware that goes with it, stock firmware we're talking about here, they don't appreciate integrations or people that are hanging off that miner and trying to monitor it continuously. So we're in situations where, like with MicroBT, they have a very great, very powerful, very robust API, but the problem that we run into is they're quick to make changes to it, and it's hard to support that across all the firmware versions. And it's like simple things too. I'm, I'm a developer, or I like to try to still be a developer. I wish I could do it more. And it's simple things. You know, you make a quick bug when you're making some JSON or something, some some object structure, and you forget a comma, and now it's invalid. Really easy to do, but like that's one that we have are dealing with, I think, today still in the way that they report fans where they're missing a comma in something. So it makes it... And the problem is once you once they have that bug in a firmware version once and one user installs it, we have to support it forever because people don't like to upgrade firmware constantly because you never know. I couldn't tell you if if you go from a 2022 version to a 2023 version, the machine's going to perform the same. Nobody knows. You hope it does, and you hope you get a couple extra bells and whistles in there and some added functionality, but you can't guarantee it. So some people generally find a version that works for what they need, and then they stick with it forever. And they don't realize that maybe the version that they like is a version that we don't like. So integrating with the miners is uh, a pain in the butt. Uh, there's no uniformity, no is standard. There, is there a worse offender? The worst offender? Yeah, probably Bitmain. Yeah, Bitmain's... Bitmain is the... Uh, they have most of the market share, but you can tell that they design the miner to do what they need, not necessarily what probably the users or the integrators need. So our integrations with Bitmain... Like, what's miner's got a really nice API and everything, but with Bitmain for a large chunk of the operations, we are doing what your browser does when you go to the web page and you enter in pools and you hit save or you change your power mode and you go to low or normal or sleep and hit save. For Bitmain, we have to like open the dev console in our browsers and kind of reverse engineer what that quote unquote API looks like. And often for, for some miners, not Bitmain in this scenario, but for some of them, we're like parsing HTML, which is, it's, that's a very loose thing. It's, it's, it's like trying to write code to parse a paper uh, consistently from two, two users and, you know, two authors, and there's going to be no uniformity. Somebody adds a, a period, and all of a sudden, your logic breaks. So integrating with miners is very fragile. Uh, the other side of it, though, um, like the PDUs, PDUs and network switches are some two of the most commonly uh, added devices to Foreman. With PDUs, you get consumption. You also get the ability to turn the miner on and off, like at the port. Uh, with network switches, we have the ability to kind of walk through all the switches, and we can see what miners plugged into each port. And if you cabled your facility consistently, meaning, as an example, maybe the first port on the switch goes to this rack location, the next one goes to the location next to it, and you've consistently cabled the entire facility, 
we can query all the switches, we know where all the miners are, and then we can auto-generate your sitemap in less than a minute. So if you're a 30,000 miner, if you have a, a mine that has 30,000 machines, you want automation and you want to be able to generate that stuff immediately. Those are nice because they are very spec kind of, I don't want to say regulated because it's a, it's a loaded term around here, but there's specifications that outline all that. So SNMP is the protocol for a lot of that stuff, but the miners are definitely the hardest part. And anything that's a product of a minor manufacturer. So I would say the, the cooling towers and stuff like that still made by the same company, still kind of the same smell. Gotcha. I appreciate you saying that. And I've heard that from a lot of firmware developers as well. Um, let's go to the example you're just using there about a large deployment and tell me about how that all happens. And maybe it's boring. It's the same way it is for a small miner. Um, hopefully it is because that'd be kind of simple, but I have a feeling it's slightly different. I'm just from our experience at Compass and then other miners I speak with, you know, these big deployments get hairy fast because there's so many things built on top of each other. And most people, when I think about it, it's like, well, it's 30,000 miners is the same as 5,000 miners. It's just plugging in more switches. But from my understanding, it's not because there's things built on top of each other. Yeah. A large mine has large problems and the deployments never go smooth. Sometimes people get into this, this mode where, and it makes sense, you know, if you're, if you're business and you need to start generating revenue right away, you don't want to say, well, let's go ahead and do it right and make this take six months. We're going to go ahead and just throw them on the shelf as quick as we can. And then we'll come back through on rainy days. And once we're through all the mess and then we'll figure out what the heck we just did. But as of right now, let's just throw them on the shelf and get them mining because that's the most important part. Automation is important for that too. So with, with, with Foreman, we can auto, you can configure auto scans, auto scans the network. You just tell it what the IP range is. So if you're racking and stacking and throwing miners into the shelf, you don't want to have somebody sitting on the side constantly scanning the network and configuring pools. So we can do the continuous network scan, add the miners in, and then you can create a what we call a trigger to auto-configure pools if miners don't have the correct pools. So now you're literally just focused on the physical work. Take it out of the box. Hopefully it's already out of the box and they're just sitting on a cart. Ho hopefully. So take it off the cart, put it on the shelf, cable it up, move to the next one. And as soon as you throw the breaker, Foreman finds it and configures everything. But a deployment can be very, very complicated because a large deployment is probably going to be a publicly traded company or it's a large scale host and inventory is key. So you have to know where every single miner is located. You have to get serials connected to it because generally when somebody sends you a machine or when you buy a machine, you're tracking an asset, you're probably tracking the serial number. So you can get up and mining very quick, but doing that serial grab is can be a slower part. So that ends up looking like if you were using us, you put the miner on the shelf and we have this thing called an interactive miner head. And I'm sorry if I'm talking about Foreman too much here. No, this is, okay. That's why you're on. So, so <laughs> you put the miner on the shelf and we have this process called an interactive miner ad. And it's kind of like you're, you're building your site map as you go. Yeah. So if it's a 10 by 10 rack, 10 rows, 10 columns, you enter in 10 by 10, you pick a profile, which would be you know, Bitmain or what's miner or something like that. You put that, you hit start, and now you get this like grid that's blinking. And you go top left and it says start here. So you put the miner on the shelf, you press IP report, and then you scan the serial. So now you're positioning the miners into Foreman. You're also telling us, you're, you're telling us exactly where it's located. We want to know what type of machine it is. We can also track who deployed it. So we know who put the machine in, into service and we've got the serial. So that's the, that's kind of the holy grail of a deployment. You, you get everything on the shelf, you get a position, you tell us where it is, you tell us what the serial is. And then the nice thing is if you have the switch integration too, now your techs can be a little lazier because they can, maybe it's a, a hot day, you need to get some miners off the top shelf and get them to, sell, to a different rack or container. You can take them off, not have to worry about cleaning up that map, plug them into a different container. And then when we're digging through the switches every minute or two, we see the MAC address has moved to a different container we bring that miner with the serial over into the new container. So your sitemap's fully automated. So we're trying to give tools to help techs operate quicker because their overhead, it's, it's, it, they, they have a ton of overhead already. And if they're, they're generally solving one problem 30,000 times. So if you can save 30 seconds, yeah. it can really add up. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do. And I think that what we end up doing, we end up saving minutes 
So otherwise you're dragging laptops around, you're scanning into Excel sheets and you're, you can't do it together. It's not collaborative and somebody misses a barcode and now you're, all your rows are off and oh shoot, we've been, we've been one minor off. What minor are we off? Oh, shoot, we got to go redo it all. So we give you a little more user feedback, let you see what's happening while it's happening and it, it really saves you a lot of time. Yeah, the efficiency there is uh, really important. That's a, been a conversation point for a lot of public miners that we've had on the show recently. Um, the kind of leaning to this efficiency narrative as opposed to last year was like hash rate guidance. Yeah. But like, oh, now I'm the less efficient miner, which is mm -hmm. sort of a funny swap for them. But yeah. I understand why. Um, and they've talked a lot about this, the deployments and being efficient with your techs and being efficient with your repairs. Yeah. Um, and software is going to eat that up. Yeah, say. yeah. And then and ticketing and all too, sometimes sometimes it can be tricky to diagnose the problem that a miner might have. Foreman, we give you a very simple diagnostic today. We give you a quick diagnosis today. And that could be uh, maybe miners not submitting shares. And that could be for a whole bunch of reasons. We're working on right now making that a little more juicy. So we're, we're, we have this new log search capability where you can ingest all the logs from the miners and do a quick search through all of them. So if you said, hey, I just lost a temp sensor uh, yesterday. I need to see if these other 500 miners that just went down too, did they do the same thing? So now you could mass pool logs and do a search across all of them and look for you know, temp sensor one and failed or something. And you'll say, oh shoot, all 500 just hit. So that's, yeah. that's what happened. So our diagnostics, our, our diagnosis right now is surface level. It'll say not submitting shares. And that just means basically look at it because the miner's not submitting anything to the pool. And then the tech will have to kind of dig into the miner pull the kernel log maybe themselves if they're if they're not using some of the cool sexy newer features try to dig through it and see it's missing a temp sensor and then you, you can't have 10 techs digging through logs constantly trying to do that stuff so yeah. we have like a ticketing thing now too where you would generally have like maybe more senior tech doing the triage and kind of just saying hey 10 miners are offline i'm going to make i'm going to do a quick quick diagnostic check see what's going on Mass create a ticket, tell my technicians, hey, these 10 miners need to have a fan replaced. Don't worry about why, just replace the fan on these. So now you're making your your techs are, it's, now it's less noise for them. They don't have to diagnose. It's yeah. more of just like a technician do kind of thing while somebody else is orchestrating it and creating tickets and diagnosing and just feeding them like a yeah. work log. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I think that efficiency nerve is, is going to pick up more and we're yeah. going to see more people. Mm -hmm turning to a software to do that, um, which you guys already have like a big lead on. So let's talk about curtailment and energy. Uh, you guys are building software solutions for small miners, big miners, and all these miners are pulling energy. It's a, the largest thing they're pulling and their lot largest expenditure. Software makes all this easier. How do you guys think about energy at Foreman and what are some of the tools that you guys are building or have built? Yeah, so uh, about a year and a half ago, I had no idea what curtailment was. I had no idea that the grid needed to be balanced. I had no idea that it's more to it than just turning the light switch on and off. I had no idea that you can be paid to turn off. I had, it, it, it was an eye-opening experience when we had one of our customers ask us to build something for them. And that's how most, most of what Foreman has was, came to fruition. It was from a customer who has a need and we listen and that's what we build. So we had some somebody come to us just saying that I need a way to reduce the consumption at my mind periodically. And that was the breadcrumb for us to start automating curtailment. And they just had a simple ask. It was, I want to be able to say, get down to 10 megawatts and I need to stay there while we do some maintenance. And then I want to be able to say, come back up to a hundred. Very simple piece. But then you, once uh, one of the CSPs out there, a curtailment service provider who represents your load on the grid and bids you into kind of demand response programs and stuff like that. Once they heard about that piece, it was kind of like, well, why aren't we doing something together? So curtailment's huge. And I think that within the last year or so, because it's not as easy to mine as it was before, you can't just, you know, just continue to pay power because you know, your Bitcoin's taken off through the roof and it's just a race to get as many miners on the shelf and uptime's got to be a hundred percent. Now it's, we need to really mine when it's profitable. And if there's ways to be more profitable by not mining, that's what we need to be focusing on. So 
that's where demand response comes in. With demand response, the, there's you're, you're you're kind of acting as an insurance policy to the grid. So the grid has a certain amount of production that they have. There's a certain amount of energy on the grid that people can consume, and you can't have excess and you can't have a deficit. It's got to be perfect harmony. So if there's an excess, you could go out of frequency and the grid could shut down. If there's a deficit, you could have a big freeze like you had in Texas in 2021. So supply has to match demand. And whenever there's an imbalance, somebody needs to turn off. So we have more to give out because you need to keep people's houses on. You need to keep the hospitals lit up. So that's what Bitcoin mining solves for the grid. And that's the demand response side. There's a demand and you can respond. And in that capacity, you are an insurance policy to the grid. So if the grid needs you, they are paying you year round, often whether or not you're performing, just to be available. And then when a big freeze is coming through, they say, hey, you know, insurance policy of mine, I'm going to pay you to turn off and I'm going to pay, I'm going to keep paying you, but you got to turn off right now. And that's what, that was where we started. So we integrated with a couple of CSPs, curtailment service providers. So if you're, if you're a load in most ISOs, you can't go right to the, 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 the ISO, the kind of that, that body itself that represents that grid. You can't go to them and say, Hey, it's me, Will. I'd like to, I'd like to start curtailing. They might listen. To me. They might listen. You have a pretty good podcast. You don't know. So you can't go to them and, and, and represent yourself. You go to a CSP or a, a queasy, a qualified scheduling entity in ERCOT. You go to one of them and you say, Hey, I've got 10 megs. I want to participate. They determine what your profile looks like, how you can participate, what type of programs you can participate in, and then they work with the ISO to get you bitted into the market and to start getting you kind of that insurance check every month or every quarter. There, there's a wide array, there's a wide range on types of curtailment. You can have slow, which I would say slow is anything more than a 30-minute notice, but traditionally I think it was probably a little more like a day ahead. So that would be like, hey, Will, tomorrow where there's going to be a weather event, I'm letting you know right now we're probably going to need you to turn off at 1 tomorrow. And for those, that's pretty easy to do. The risk you have with those, though, is you're probably throwing breakers, so killing the power to the facility. If, you have, if you're a container-based facility and you got 50 containers, that means you're throwing 50 breakers. And when you, turn, when you close the breaker and you bring the... The, the electricity back to your machines, there's a rush that comes with it. So sometimes you'll you'll lose fans, you'll lose hash boards, you'll lose temp sensors. They're common to go if you're just throwing breakers constantly. So there's there's the slow acting and then there's the fast acting stuff too. Uh, and fast acting could be, I'd say less than 30 minutes. So maybe a 10 minute dispatch. In ERCOT, it could be seconds if it's a frequency event and frequency goes, what we talked about, Grid supply and demand has to match, and if there's too much or too little, the frequency on the grid will drift away from 60 hertz. And if it drifts too far out of this allowed range, you, depending on the, the designation of the program you're in, you have to re respond within seconds and curtail or ramp up to help counter it to get the grid back into back back closer to 60 hertz. And those all happen within 16 seconds or so. So there's like really really fast acting curtailments, and then there's slow acting curtailments. We can kind of do all that stuff at the software level. So we integrate with a CSP and we see those demand response signals and they might say, hey, Will, in 10 minutes you got to be down or hey, Will, tomorrow you got to be down and we will schedule it. And then when the event happens, we will curtail the facility, not by throwing breakers, but by putting the miner into sleep. So it's kind of like when you put your PC into hibernate mode and the little yellow light on the front when the front keeps blinking, that's kind of what we're doing. We're kind of just saying pause, and that takes it from, say, 3250 down to maybe 90 watts or so. So it's about a 97%-ish cut on power. And based on those programs you're participating in, you're generally paid based on the load you can control. So they'll do a test, and they'll say, hey, you got a 10 meg facility. We ran a curtailment. Looks like you came down 9.6 megs. We'll put you in the market for 9.6 megs. So... You're kind of set up for success, and if you're trying to get into the really, really aggressive demand response revenue programs, they're quick and they're fast acting, and you can't physically do them. So if you're in PJM, as one of them, there's an ancillary program called Sync, Sync Reserves, Synchronized Reserves. 
that's a 10 minute dispatch. <clears throat> and if you have 50 containers, you would need probably 50 Olympic sprinters to hit a, hit a 10 minute, to hit breakers on all, all 50 containers. They've got better things to do than run around and throw breakers. So you're not going to be able to do a 10 minute dispatch. And if you don't, if you fail the dispatch, you'll get yanked from the program. So there goes that, I don't know, say 150, 160 K per megawatt year you could have made. So if you have a 10 meg site, that's $1.6 million a year. You're making off demand response revenue, rough numbers. So you need to be in the programs, you need to be performing and you need software to do it. And the most aggressive programs, the ones that pay the best need software automation and often need firmware too. Micro BT, they've got, they're listening in some capacity and they give you some, some cool ways to, you know, it's, it's a little more flip this lever here, pull this book on the shelf, wink at the poster. And then a, you know, a door opens up. It's, they have, they have a couple toggles and levers you can flip that'll make them perform quicker. Bitmain, not so much. So that's where custom firmware is also key, depending on the type of program you're participating in. If it's in a 10 minute program, you're fine on stock everywhere. But if you're getting into a less than 10 minute dispatch, if you're, you're probably in ERCOT and in ERCOT, those programs can move very quick. You're tracking targets every five minutes. You're shifting your load based on five minute sked runs. So, you know, every five minutes, I've got to come up five megs. I've got to come down a meg. I've got to come down a meg. I've got to go up a meg. And for that, to get it within five minutes consistently while being linear, can't just be this lag and then it ramps really quick. It's got to be a step. And if you're not stepping and following that linear curve, you'll, you'll get taken out or you won't even get enrolled. So that's where, unfortunately for a lot of this firmware is key. What is Foreman doing on that front to, to help integrate that automation? You said the, the firmware is key there, but do you guys have these built-in solutions already or you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have it now. So we integrate with most major CSPs, again, those curtailment service providers that represent your load on the grid or queasies in ERCOT. So they enroll you. We automatically get the dispatches as soon as kind of the grid's not calling you up, but we'll just say calling you up, Will, and saying, hey, in 10 minutes, you have to be off. They come directly to us. We curtail the load as soon as it's time. And the other nice thing about that too is when we curtail it, we delay it as long as possible. So if it's a 10 minute dispatch, you've got to be down in 10 minutes. Let's keep you mining for about eight and a half if we can, and then we'll rip you down. So you get eight more minutes of revenue. Um, so yeah, those, those dispatches come directly to us. We ramp the facility down. As soon as the dispatch ends, we ramp the facility back up. Very easy to do that in less than a minute. Uh, we can, we can really ramp facilities pretty quickly. Um, and in ERCOT, we can we can do even the, the, the 15, 16 second adjustments too, frequency events, all that stuff. So we are kind of the orchestrator to it. The signals come to us, we dispatch it to the miners. And if you're a large scale facility and you have three phase power, you need to keep those three phases of power balanced and we can do that too. So you're actually coming down gracefully, meeting these curtailment requirements while balancing your three phase power on the transformers. Yeah. Thanks for walking me through that. Uh, I think a lot of listeners are going to be intrigued by that because it hasn't been uh, explained very well to date so far in this podcast. Last question for you as we sort of wrap up here. What are some aspirational items uh, that fo Foreman's working on or you're seeing firmware providers or just things that you would like to see in the space in terms of this middle stack of communicating between the facilities, energy providers, miners, investors? What are some things that you would like to have on a dream platform? And a dream platform, hmm. I guess I'd like everybody using it, and uh, <laughs> that would be great. Yes. yes. Uh, from from our side, I think that we've got a lot more to do on in you know, machine. From our side, we've got a lot more to do on kind of the machine diagnostic side. I think we'd like to make it so the users don't have to uh, ever look at a kernel log, and we can do it for you. So we're kind of getting a feed. We're building this out now. That's the only reason we're talking about it. Otherwise, it was secret. So. Uh, we're getting a feed of the kernel logs. We're diagnosing machines detailed for you, telling you what's going on. If I had my way, if I had my way, I would also like to see manufacturers get more on board with the things. This is, you know, not really me for form, and this is more me just kind of preaching in case a manufacturer is listening here. Yeah. I wish the manufacturers got more on board with the needs of the community now rather than their needs as a 
I mean, really, all these machines, they're the miners first, right? They produce it, they need it, they plug it in, they mine as yeah. long as they can, then they sell it to you. The reason custom firmware exists is because they put you in a box and they don't listen to what their users need. And that means that you can't participate in some of these fast acting programs. So I wish there was more openness from the manufacturers to listen to what people need and to see where they're really making revenue. And it's it would be a great business move for them because if their customers can't mine and they're not profitable, they're going to stop buying machines, yeah. which means that the customers that are staying alive today off of demand response, kind of supplemental revenue, they need to be able to perform in these programs. And that comes down to the machines. So if you want to keep selling machines, you have to sell machines that have the load profile that's needed based on where the customers are going. And ERCOT's pushing the envelope. It's incredible what's happening in, in Texas. The manufacturers need to get on board too. Awesome. Well, let's leave it there. Dan, thank you so much for joining the Mining Pod. Uh, lots of insights. We'll have to have you on again soon. Yeah. Thanks again. Thank you, man. Love it.